a la mano derecha, pero no... Right, folks, I'm not going to stand on ceremony. I want to try and get another couple of episodes out in the next week or so because I've got a million other things going on with work and various other projects and stuff. So let's just crack on so I can get this intro recorded and then immediately start editing the next episode and hopefully get that out in the next couple of days. So (laughs) today's topic. So usually this would be a bit of a heavy topic to cover But sandwiched as it is between Holocaust denial on one side, that was the last episode with Carolyn Yeager, and paedophilia on the other. So I'm booked in for a conversation with Tom O'Carroll, a follow-up to the last episode we did a couple of years ago um, in the next couple of days. Yeah, in light of that, today's topic, which is sex with animals, or bestiality as it's known, feels a bit more like (laughs) light relief, if I'm honest. So anyway, my guest today is Dr. Hani Maletsky. Hani is a licensed clinical social worker and certified sex therapist who has served on the board of the American Association of Sexuality Educators, Counselors and Therapists. She is the author of Mother Son Incest, The Unthinkable Broken Taboo Persists, and the book which forms the basis of today's discussion, which is Understanding Bestiality and Zoophilia. So, uh, despite this sort of being light relief, at least in in light of the Holocaust and paedophilia, just a quick warning that there is a couple of minutes towards the end of this episode that are particularly graphic, I guess. It's where we talk about a branch of bestiality, a, a rare, thin branch of bestiality known as zoo sadism where people get kicks out of being cruel to animals basically now we didn't go too deep into it as a topic like i say it's only a couple of minutes but it it just it would have been neglectful not to mention it since it is a thing even even though it's sort of only tangentially related so yeah there's your warning anyway as predicted the podcast on youtube is doing worse and worse and probably due to this no longer being a advertiser-friendly content, I guess. Um, It doesn't seem to have affected the audio version on like SoundCloud and iTunes yet, but no doubt that's imminent. So if you'd like to support the podcast, you can do so by going to renegadeape.com forward slash support. Got a couple of options on there. We are on Patreon, but I've also started on subscribe star as well, which is basically, it's a Patreon alternative. It was one that got set up after a load of people got booted off Patreon and there was like this whole free speech malarkey that resulted out of it. And then Subscribestar was a bit of a, like, it's a bit of a safe haven for people that are covering controversial topics, basically. And so I'm I'm much less likely to get booted off there, I think. Again, with, with YouTube, it's only a matter of time and potentially with Patreon as well because they are a bit sensitive over there. Whereas on Subscribestar, during the actual verification process, where I had to contact the admin, uh, tell them what the podcast was about. They got back to me, approved the account, and said they loved the the concept of the podcast. So, yeah, I feel a bit more secure over there. So that's subscribestar.com forward slash renegade ape. And just like Patreon, a few rewards and stuff over there. So, you, you know, you get access to message me and stuff. I don't allow people to contact me anymore. There's nothing on my contact page because... I can't be I can't be asked sifting through the moaning and complaining. So yeah, if you sign up on Patreon, subscribe, star, whatever, you can contact me, you can suggest episodes, any topics, any guests you'd like me to reach out to to contact. You can get a shout out on the podcast, get a personalized thank you video at certain tiers, and also like there's a producer credit as well if you want your name in the show notes with like a little link or something you've got to promote. That's available as a reward as well. And if you can't be asked with any rewards, you don't want to be mithered with signing up to a new website or getting emails and notifications or anything like that, there is an option on the support page of the website where you can just sign up, make a one-time or recurring donation, no fuss, help me pay the bills, and yeah, you won't hear anything from me. So yeah, something to suit everyone there, I guess. Anyway, I'm blabbering on, I'm boring myself. Let's crack on. Please enjoy my conversation with Dr. Hani Maletsky. Hani Maletsky, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. 
So, before we get into the thick of it with bestiality and everything that's related to it, let's just start right back from scratch. So, before being uh, any sort of specialist, you are in general a sex therapist. So, I'm first I'm interested in how and why you became a sex therapist and then how this niche came into the picture as well. Okay. So I was already in my 20s when I went to college and I had no idea what I wanted to do when I grow up. So I started taking all kinds of classes and one of them was human sexuality and I really loved it. I aced it. And uh, on the last meeting, we were talking about sex therapy, which was a new concept to me. I never knew about this profession. So I was very uh, excited to find out about it. And I started to look into this and I found ASECT, the American Association for Sexuality Educators, Counselors and Therapists. And I signed up as a member and asked for the guidelines of what I need to do to become a sex therapist. And I followed them. The first of them was to become a psychotherapist, a licensed psychotherapist. So I did that. And while I was doing that, I also took all kinds of trainings in human sexuality. And before I knew it, I was certified as a sex therapist by ASECT. And because I like to be a student, I decided that I also wanted to get a PhD. So I went to the Institute for Advanced Study of Human Sexuality in San Francisco. It doesn't exist anymore. But at the time, that was like the only school available. And uh, when it came time to choose my uh, topic for dissertation, I, um, you know, I was already working at the time, of course, as a sex therapist. And I had one client who came to me because he was having sex with dogs. And he wanted to stop and he didn't know what to do with himself. He felt really, really bad. So I thought, hmm, I don't know of any study about this topic. Why don't I do a study on that? I can do like... Let me just stop you there. So, okay. Because I think that from what I understand, the, the study is the basis for the book. So, right. uh, And the, this conversation is based on the content of that book. So let's just, let's just, let's stay with this a moment. So you're, so you're a sex therapist and Mm -hmm. I'm guessing part of the intrigue of becoming a sex therapist. And I I say this as somebody that's worked within the the sex industry is there's a, a certain intrigue about sex beyond, beyond the obvious. There's, you know, the psychology behind it, the people that get involved in it, the various different tastes that people have and how do they develop those tastes and things like that. And you're going to bump into all sorts of different proclivities and and fetishes and things like that. Right. But I'm guessing maybe bestiality never came up in the sort of sex ed 101 course at college. Okay. No, that's why it was like a new thing. You know, I mean, I heard of that and, you know, it's part of the training we have to take. um, It's called a SAR. It's a sexual attitude reassessment where we get to watch different videos and talk about different subjects just to kind of prepare us for anything that walks into the door, you know, through the door so that we're not going to freak out. And at least we'll know if we can handle this or maybe refer to somebody else sort of like, you know, figure out what our attitude is about the subject. So bestiality was one of the subjects that we talked about, but only in that in that seminar. Right, yes, yes. So so I didn't know what to do with that. <laughs> so as well, you said, I'm sort of intrigued whether you, when you said it, this, this course just clicked for you, what, what is the intrigue for you about human sexuality? What, what was it that clicked where it was like, ah, this, this is my subject. This is what I want to do as a career. I think that I like challenges and I like to go where most people don't want to go. Right. I can appreciate <laughs> that sentiment. Yeah. <laughs> and I also thought when I heard about the, the profession of sex therapist, I thought, you know, they showed us videos of Masters and Johnson 
And it looked like it was very simple. You just tell people, you know, do this and do that. And, and you are able to fix problems that people have. And I thought, wow, that's going to be so rewarding. And, you right. know, you, you do it quickly. Of course, then I learned that it's not so at all. You know, first of all, like I said, you have to become a psychotherapist mm. because every sexual issue does not come in a vacuum. No. There's always other issues that come together with that, you know, whether you're in a relationship or not. There's anxiety, there's depression, there is stress, there's relationship issues with other people. So you really need to deal with everything. You cannot just deal with the sexual symptom because then you're not going to really fix it. Right. So when So it's always a lot more complicated. So when you first encounter this guy, this guy first walks into the office and says, I'm having sex with dogs. What is your, because I'm guessing there's two reactions going on. One is a sort of personal gut reaction and then there's a professional reaction. So what was, what was going on there for you when you first heard this? I think I was excited to get a, a client with a, with a presenting problem like that, you know, <laughs> <Right>. because, because <laughs> yeah. like I said, I like to go where other people don't go. And yes. he was also telling me that he's been to several therapists right. and none of them actually wanted to work with him. Right. Uh, how, how long had you been in the profession at this time? I just started, I, maybe a year. Oh, wow. <laughs> Straight in there. Okay. So We've we've got this guy. He's he's mentioned he's he's having sex with dogs and he wants to stop. And so yeah, I sort of rudely interrupted, but I did think we needed to cover a couple of things there. You decided off the basis of this that maybe this needs looking into further. Then you went to look at the, what literature was out there, realized there wasn't right. very much, and thought, right, I'm going to go out and study this. Right, and also I I have been working with him for a while at this point, and I really didn't know what to do with him. You know, I tried different things, different techniques, things right. that I work. So like what? Because I know people are going to hear that and be like, well, what technique? Because, you know, the, the obvious technique is to just go, just keep your dick in your pants. Stop having sex with dogs. So what, yeah, that's what... not so simple. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so why is it? So again, people will be saying, um, why is it not so simple? And what sort of techniques are you, uh, and ideas are you trying with somebody like that? Well, it's not simple because it's an urge. And he lived in a, in a rural area where there were a lot of dogs, you know, free, wandering around, and they all knew him. And so when he was walking around by himself at night, all the dogs came to him. <laughs> and like the Pied Piper. They know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, you know, I was trying techniques that I have been using with sex offenders, you know, changing the way you think, changing your behaviors. Don't go out at night hmm. to start with. Don't get close to the dogs, which was a little impossible because they were all over. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, it, it was very difficult and he was very religious. Oh, wow. Wow. And he was, he was tormented. He yeah. was really tormented and he couldn't stop. Right. Okay. So, yeah, I'm interested now in this moving to, to research in it because, again, I can imagine that a sex therapist is one of the more interesting forms of psychotherapy. You know, if, if, mm. you, if you bring that up, unless you're at an extremely sort of conservative event or something like that, most people, when you tell them what your profession is, it's like, oh, that's interesting. It's, you know, it's more interesting than working at a supermarket or McDonald's or whatever. And people, right. it's a conversation starter. People want to know about it. It's an almost universal shared interest. But I can tell you that I love what I do. You know, yep. there's never a dull moment. Well, yeah. Well, again, I can testify to that. having worked in the sex industry. But um, <laughs> to make that leap into specializing in this particular subject, that potentially serves to undermine that to a degree, I imagine. It's one thing to say I'm a sex therapist. It's another thing entirely to say I work in the field of bestiality. People is, are going to have a, a, a gut reaction to that, a, a feelings of revulsion and disgust, and maybe even question your motivation like why the hell would you want to work with people like that why would you want to study something like that so um, right. well I guess a two-part question arises out of that and one is why make that leap besides intrigue into into this particular topic and has there been any fallout from it sort of personally or professionally 
So, you know, when the place where I worked at the time, I, I was not self-employed. I was working for um, an organization yep. and we had staff meetings and I announced at, the st- at one of the staff meetings that this is my topic of dissertation and whatever you just said, I was bombarded from everybody about how stupid an idea that is right. because I'm going to really pigeonhole myself in 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 this specialty mm-hmm. and people are going to be disgusted and they're not going to want to see me and what am I doing to myself and all that. But I am very stubborn and right. um, I was I was very intrigued by this topic and I thought it would be it can be a really good topic for for research because there's there was nothing out there and i i wanted to learn more what happened actually was that now people go to my website and they see what i've written and they say to me i knew i can come to you and i can tell you anything because you already heard anything everything yes yeah so in a way it helped because people feel very comfortable telling me things and, and, you know, people who come to see me, I would say everybody, they tell me their most intimate yep. secrets. And it is so humbling, really. Right. And and they feel comfortable, which is great. I'm very fortunate. Yeah, I can. well, I can imagine it have that effect. If, like, you, you feel like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm masturbating, like, four times a day or whatever, and I'm going to go look for a sex therapist, and it's like, oh... <laughs> This person deals with people that have sex with animals. Yeah. Okay. That's, yeah. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> maybe that's not so. Exactly. I, you know what? I wonder how many people you've cured without I've, I've even seeing them. <laughs> like they've just seen the website <laughs> and gone, you know what? Maybe it's not such a problem after all. <laughs> it's possible. <laughs> so, okay. So I've done a bit of research into the book. Obviously, I do a lot of research for this podcast. I can never read people's books page for page, but a bit of the material that I could could gather together that's mm-hmm. th- that's in your book that other people have cited because it is in the literature of this subject. You are one of the most sort of cited researchers. Your name pops up in all sorts of different papers. But this this particular sentence stood out for me from from your book. You've put that hopefully. This work will help to demystify a topic which has long suffered ridicule and pseudoscientific rhetoric and will open the door to further more needed research. So just a few things I want to pick up on there. One is, why is more research needed? Again, I can understand it from a point of view of intrigue and it just being bizarre and interesting. But what what is to be gained from doing more research in this particular area? Well... People who have sex with animals are are people, and some of them need help. You know, not everybody wants to stop. Some of them are very happy with what they're doing. Some of them are very unhappy, like my client. And they're tormented. And he went to several therapists who didn't know what to do with him and sent them away. And I just thought, that's not right. You know, if somebody wants help, they should be able to get the help they need. And also, since I did the study, I realized that there's more to it. Some people come to see me from other states. You know, they fly just to come and see me because they have sex with animals, but that's not the issue they want to talk about. They want to talk about other things, but they cannot be authentic with their therapist right. because they can't tell them everything. Yes. So, so they rather come to me to talk about whatever just so that they can be completely honest about who they are. Right, okay. And I, th- I think if other therapists would be accepting of that, not that, not that to tell them that it's, you know, that they should go out and do it, but accepting the fact that this is who they are and this is what they do and no judgment, then, okay, we can put it aside and let's talk about other things. Right, okay. And... Um... A couple of other things. One, one is where he says it's a topic that's long suffered ridicule. Do you mean the, the research itself has suffered ridicule or the act has suffered ridicule? Because I guess the first thing people are going to think, well, of course it's suffered ridicule and, and maybe so it should. What, what would your reaction be to that? Well, I think that when people are uncomfortable, they start making jokes about things. And this is a very uncomfortable topic for most people. Right. And yes, it has been ridiculed 
you know, all over. I mean, there was no really research, I think, serious research before I came around. After right. me, there have been other studies, but I was pretty much the first person who, who started doing something about this. And, you know, all I could find was, you know, movies like um, uh, Woody Allen, Everything You Ever Wanted to Know About Sex. Have you seen that? No, I haven't, no. There's, there's a, a scene, it's like different scenes in this movie. It's a great movie. It's old. And there's one scene of a, a psychiatrist who falls in love with a sheep. Okay. And it, it, the portrayal is very, very true to how it's, it's, it happens, but it's really funny, right. you know, and they're really mocking the whole idea. But there are some people who are really tormented about that. And for them, it, there's nothing to, to make jokes about. For right. them, it's a very serious thing. Okay. Um, and this leads us into the, the, the last one where you say that the, the topic is surrounded with pseudoscientific rhetoric. What would you say that are the main pseudoscience points that are made about this or that misguided facts or whatever about this topic that you feel are best quickly dispelled before we can move on into what's true about it? Um, I think there's a lot of different things, but the thing that was really surprising to me that I found that I think is very different from what everybody else thinks is mm -hmm. that in most cases, men are more often interested in, in sex with animals, while, you know, when you read about it, when you watch porn videos, it's usually a woman with an animal, usually a dog. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that when the men have sex with the animal, in most cases, it's the animal who does the penetration. And that always blows everybody <laughs> away. Nobody expects that. Yeah, I, I, well, I'm surprised by that. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Let, well, most say, people are. Well, we'll. I, I want to sort of dig into the the sort of, <laughs> I guess, the demographics and some of the statistics a bit later on of, of who's doing what to who, basically. Before then, though, let's start with some definitions, shall we? The two main ones that come up are bestiality and zoophilia. Mm -hmm. What what would your distinction be between those two? Well, bestiality is is the the act of having sex with an animal. Okay. And zoophilia is is more about emotions. Hmm. You know, it's more about love, attraction. I would even say that it's a sexual orientation. Right. Okay. So just to be clear, so bestiality is that's clear. Zoophilia is based on emotion and you said attraction. Can zoophilia be in the absence of attraction and just based purely on love and emotion? Or is there need, know, to be, need to be a, a sexual attraction there? At first, I, I said that it was only emotion. And then when I was thinking about it more, I decided that it has to have some attraction because there's so many people who are in love with their animals. Yes, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's we can't expect to to say that everybody is a zoo. That's how they call themselves in short. Right. So I think the attraction is is a major part, a major component of this. Right, okay. So all the crazy cat ladies and people that like have little puppies instead of kids and stuff like that. It's fine. <laughs> You're not a zoo. <laughs> right. Um, it's and... also a different kind of love. You know, it's not that they see the animals as their kids. They see them as partners, as equals. Mm. It's more of a romantic love. And so I'm wondering whether one can exist without the other. Yeah, I'm assuming, I can, I'm assuming the act of bestiality can take place in the absence of zoophilia. Right. Does zoophilia tend to take place with the absence of bestiality? So it's just purely I've, affection I've and doesn't spill that. over. Yeah. I've heard of that. Uh, people have told me that if their partner, their animal partner, is not interested in sex, they will not have sex with the animal. Right. But they still love it and 
treated as their wife or husband or whatever. Right. Okay. Let's let's delve into this now. So, <laughs> I guess for a lot of people, this particular phenomenon, to the extent that it is one, could maybe be a, a product of the internet. It's a sort of thing that people see on the internet. There's this a common accusation with the development of sexuality. You know, everyone starts off just plain old vanilla sex, but then you start watching porn and you get more and more extreme tastes and you stumble across more and more extreme acts and then that sort of shapes your sexuality. And so bestiality could be considered right at the extreme end of the spectrum. It's something that's sort of the result of the, the internet and modern society and this constant push towards extreme types of sex. However, you argue in your book that this goes all the way back to sort of the dawn of civilization. So I was just wondering if you'd um, be willing to give us some some sort of standout or interesting examples. Okay. But before that, I just want to say something about what you just said. Okay. There are studies that show that you're not interested in a particular subject of porn unless you are already sort of into it already, even though you may not even know that you're into into it. Oh, well, inter so interesting. So you, because it is, it is a common argument that this sort of taste and trend for sort of demeaning women in pornography, mm -hmm. that you would argue that that's a reflection of the tastes of the people watching it, yeah. not that it's what created those tastes. That's what studies show. Right. That if if you're interested in something, let's say you're just surfing the net and you come across something, you look at it for a few seconds and you decide if this is something you want to look at or not. Mm. And if it's something that is not does not speak to you, you know, you don't have any any attraction to it, you're just going to go and, and continue to search. Right. Okay. But if it's something that grabs you, then you'll keep going. Yeah, so well, just to elaborate a little bit on what I think the alternative perspective is, I think it's sort of a sort of um, a Skinnerian behaviorist type right, idea it, that you it grows on you. Yeah, that if you're sort of say you're watching porn and uh, as a guy you're sat there masturbating in front of the computer, and you stumble across a video that's a bit bizarre or whatever, and by mere virtue of exposure to that material, whilst in a heightened state of um, sexual arousal, you come to then associate sexual arousal with the stimulus. Um, right. And, but you're saying that's that's not necessarily the case. I think that that could be, that can happen. Yeah. But I'm just telling you what studies show. Yeah, it's, it's just, it's interesting for me because I, you know, I'm 38 now and I think I f first started watching porn probably probably as a teenager, maybe 13, 14. And this was back in the day where you had to get it on VHS and it was like mm -hmm. stashed under like your mate's stepdad's bed or something like that. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I would say that the, the sort of porn that we used to watch, it was very much about here's this, here's this beautiful woman and it's this guy's job to sort of please her as much as possible and to make her come as many times as possible. And that was it. But I would argue now that I, even though I try, and I don't really watch porn anymore, it's been a few years without it, but even up to a few years ago, even I noticed that it, the frequency of sort of violent, demeaning porn was getting more and more frequent, and it was on the home pages of, of porn sites a lot. And yeah, I did wonder whether that was, again, is this just the websites catering to the taste of the guys, or whether it's the... I think so. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so anyway, <laughs> we're all over the place here. Let's <laughs> let's 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 dig into a little history. Do a, a bit of a okay. history lesson, some sort of standout examples or proof of of bestiality as a, as an act in history. So, from what I found, the practice of human animal sex began at least at the fourth glacial age, which means between forty thousand and twenty five thousand years ago. Right. Okay. And we know that because we, you know, people have found paintings and carvings in, in caves that show animals having sexual relations with humans or something that looks like a human. Right. Um, for example, there's uh, an Iron Age cave painting from the 7th century BC in Italy that portrays a man inserting his penis into a vagina or anus of a donkey. 
Right. Okay. Yeah. So if they didn't do it, at least you know that they were thinking about things like that. Yeah, I guess it does raise the question of whether those that artwork is symbolic or literal. Right. Um, yeah, we don't know. There's no way to know, yeah. but you know that it was on their mind. Right. Okay. Yeah. Is it true? I've heard about um, in Rome, like animal rape was used as a as a means of execution as well. Yeah. Yeah, I, I read about that too, and it's also in my book. And, you know, the thing about the, all the sources that I found and all the, the stories that I found is that there is no way for me to verify right. any of this. Of course, yeah. So I have a lot of stories. I have stories from all uh, history, from all cultures, from a lot of different countries, and um, well, just to, yeah, and there's and, no way to know. <laughs> well, I, I know that I'm, I'm pretty sure this one's in your book, but I'd rather you tell it than me. Please tell us about the Persian gooses in the brothels. <laughs> well, it's not just <laughs> it's not just Persia. You know, it happened in other places as well, where they were providing how do you say goose or geese? Geese, geese I guess. Yeah, <laughs> uh, they were providing geese to to the guys. So that when they had sex with them, at the moment of orgasm, they would um, break their neck. <laughs> and apparently when they do that, the, the animal starts um, contracting the muscles or whatever. Yeah. And it produces wonderful pleasure <laughs> yes. for the men. <laughs> Apparently, Who it, knows? yeah, causing the bird's sphincter to constrict and spasm, clamping down on their penises and creating pleasurable sensations. There you go. <laughs> so, yes, I guess, um, I guess just to that point, we do have to wonder whether, like, say, things like cave paintings are they to be taken literally or symbolically, and then in the cases of the of, of various historians, like you said, it's difficult to verify. I know, like. People like uh, Suetonius and Herodotus, old Roman historians, a lot of modern historians argue that they were very sort of prone to conjecture uh, and they were always writing hundreds of years after these supposed events take place. Um, mm -hmm. But then again, it's like you say with the cave paintings, symbolic, literal, it doesn't matter, it was on the minds. And whether people like Suetonius, Herodotus were talking about literal events... The fact that they were talking about this idea of using horses to rape somebody to death in Rome and, and various other sort of animal orgies that apparently took place, regardless mm -hmm. of the truth of it, it was still on their minds. And for some reason, they felt compelled to write about it. So, Right. Um, what about modern day examples, though? Because I suppose it's less easy to write off any sort of modern day examples and so I guess my question would be whether there's any places nowadays or at least in recent history any countries any cultures where bestiality is a sort of an accepted practice or a rite of passage or anything like that okay um modern age like right now happening right now well I guess as, as contemporaneously as possible just because like I say the more modern it is the less easy it is to dismiss it and the more easy it is to verify as well okay so I think the the most modern that I could find is a study on the gaucho population living on the border of Brazil and Uruguay it was um, a doctoral dissertation and um this person, his name is his or her, I don't know if it's a man or a woman, um, the name is Lil, L-E-A-L. They found that the gauchos understand bestiality as a legitimate practice within a group where the dominant culture believes, belief consists of mastering the wild. So what they do is they have sort of like... Um, a hierarchy where animals are to be followed in a certain order. So they start with having sex with a chicken and then they culminate with a mare. And when they are able to do that, they're, they're considered like now they're really men, they're macho. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm, I'm quite intri- yeah. I mean, I'm intrigued what the hierarchy of animals is between chickens and mares. I don't suppose you've got that there, have you? Yeah, I don't know what's in between. <laughs> Yeah. So they don't they don't usually engage in bestiality as a regular activity, but it is important as a part of their their sexual initiation. Yeah, you know what you know what for anyone that that doubts the veracity of this stuff, I managed to dig up a couple of modern examples as well. The first was, I mean, this is bizarre even saying this. This is Pony, the shaved orangutan of Borneo. Are you familiar with this case? No. No, okay, so this was, in Borneo, this was an orangutan that was kept in captivity. The orangutan was shaved daily, made to wear perfume and makeup, and then the the men in the village would come and pay the madam to come and have sex with this orangutan. And this is in all the papers, everybody can go check this, and the people that rescued the orangutan said that the most sort of bizarre aspect of the the whole episode was that when the the villagers came to uh, sorry when the people came to take the orangutan and save it from that situation the villagers were sort of outraged by it because they considered this orangutan part of the the village part of the family it was part of their culture and and the animal being was being sort of snatched away from them and so part of the deal that the the rescuers had to strike with the villagers so as to you know ensure a sort of peaceful transition was that the, I think it was the villagers or the, the brothel madam could go and visit the orangutan while she was being sort of looked after by these other people. And then another one, you can quickly find this clip on, on YouTube, Jeremy Clarkson on the Grand Tour. There's an episode with him over in um, Colombia uh, where he's taking landscape images on a camera and he catches a guy stood behind a donkey and he says, is that guy doing what I think he's doing? Now this is this is on Amazon Prime. This is mainstream TV, and he... yeah, they actually interviewed me for that on on this um, phenomenon in in Colombia. Yes, because there, there is a, a portion of the population there who they have regular sex with donkeys. Yes, that's the one. That's it. And he he went up to these guys. There was a group of like six, seven, eight guys there, and he's got to translate with him. And he basically says like. Did I see what I think I saw? And the guy Mm -hmm. said, yeah. And he said, hang on a minute. Is this like, is this normal? Is this accepted? And they're all very nonchalantly just going, yeah, that's, that's what we do. It's no, it's like, it's no big deal. And they said, you didn't see me there. It's like a 20 minute uh, section. Oh, so you were actually on that, on that show. All right. Well, I will for people. I'll dig that clip out and include that in the show notes. Cause no, the clip I saw was just Jeremy Clarkson interviewing the guys. It's about two minutes long. So if I can dig the clip out with you on it, I will definitely include that for people. Cause like I say, but you know, I got in a lot of trouble because of that one, because you know, they take things out of, uh, out of order. Right. And, uh, and and they make made me look like I was saying, oh yes, the Arabs do that too, and the Muslims do that, and right. So it made it a okay. race thing. Yeah, and so I've been getting so many hate emails about this, and I try to tell them, you know, I got this information from other sources, and I say these things about everybody and every culture. Right. You know, they just got that. <laughs> well, I mean, the thing is, when the people themselves are stood there saying, yes, this is something we do, I mean... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, in Colombia, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so how normal is this? So I've got some various statistics. Uh, that, oh, good. Yes, that various researchers have come up with. So Kinsey, Pomeroy and Martin, 1948, mm-hmm. said 8% men... Five percent of women have, have right. engaged in some sort of bestiality. Then Hunt, nineteen seventy four, four point nine percent of men, one point nine percent of women. Big, a bigger discrepancy there. Uh, and then nineteen ninety nine Flynn was two point four percent of men, one point one percent of women. But that was based on college students. So I'm guessing college students have are, the younger they've had less chance to sort of engage in that sort of activity. But what does your research show, and what would you say? Um, just personally, you're, from clients walking through the door, what would you say the, the male-female divide is there? Well, I think I mentioned that before. I think there's a lot more men yep. who engage in this behavior, which is pretty true for most sexual yep. behaviors that are kind of out there. Yep. You know, men tend to be more interested in, in sex in general and more interested in other kinds of sex. 
Well, you know what? Just touching on that as well, I'd be interested to know how many women you encounter that have actually got some sort of fetish or a paraphilia to the extent that it's a major part of their sexuality. So even though I was working with girls in the sex industry, and I must have met hundreds, if not thousands of girls in, in the 10, 12 years I was in and out of the industry, that question came up a lot. And very rarely did a girl have a, a thing that she was into that was a major part. It's usually I found that girls were sort of, they had things that were they were up for and they enjoyed, they were willing to try, willing to participate in, but nothing like... Nothing like when it's a guy with a foot fetish and that's sort of all he cares about. So I'm just wondering what you... What... Exactly, yeah. Same for you. Yeah, I mean, in my study, I had um, 82 men and 11 women. Right. And even the 11 women, it was more, you know, something that they did with their male partner uh, in, in most cases. It wasn't like something that they had to do. Right. A lot of right. times they had another partner, another human partner. What about well. what about age wise? Age it was all over the place, but I would say the the average or the median was about thirty something. Right. Okay. And here's a bit of an interesting one. <laughs> you might might not want to speak on it based on your your experience with uh, the grand tour, but I'm wondering whether there's anything sort of ethnicity and race wise, because and you know, the reason I ask that is. And I hate to say this. Well, I don't know if I do hate to say it. It's just, it just seems to be a fact. On porn websites, and back in the day when, when we were first getting videos off the internet, and I was in my early 20s back then, and we're showing each other these sort of shocking videos that we dug up from these various websites, it's always white folk doing the mad stuff. Whether it's... Um, <laughs> Honestly, whether it's like scatology, crapping on each other, water sports, puking on each other, animals, all that mad stuff. It's always white folk that are doing that. So I'm just wondering whether it's, um, you know, are white people disproportionately represented when it comes to bestiality as well? Well, I think that in, in <laughs> pornography in general, it's starting to change now and they're including all kinds of minority and have more d diversity but um the majority of my uh, my um subjects were white yeah okay yeah. <laughs> yeah that doesn't surprise me <laughs> yeah um any other other sort of interesting patterns and we'll get to personalities and backgrounds a, a bit later on but um, anything else that, that stands out that you know is a, a pattern in the sort of person that's walking through your doors with this particular fetish well you need to know that um i don't you know i have a lot of clients and i i have had a lot of clients over the years but i can count maybe on both hands uh how many clients i had with this particular issue hmm. so it's not like people come to see me just because of that obviously right you know, I'm first of all a psychotherapist, secondly, I'm a sex therapist, and then if they really have an issue with bestiality or zoophilia and they don't feel comfortable talking to anybody else, then they'll come to see me, unless they're in the area, of course. Yeah, I guess one of the things I'm, I'm sort of fishing for here, I guess, and this, well, this moves us nicely into the types of people that get involved in this and the background, the personality types or any other sort of psychopathology. One of the things in, in the little bit of research I've done that seems to come up over and over again is this idea of loneliness and not being able to get sex from other human beings, I guess. And right. what I'm wondering, is that an attraction thing? Are people into bestiality sort of disproportionately physically unattractive? Are they... I, I don't know, just bad with interpersonal skills. What would you say on that that front in particular, on that, that subject of, of isolation being the one of the causative factors? So I was thinking the same thing when I started out, that they probably have sex with animals because they can't get laid any other way yep. or with any other person and they're probably shy and they're insecure and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I asked a lot of questions about that, you know, in different ways to see what their answers will be. And yes, there are some who are insecure and shy and lonely and all that kind of stuff. 
but the majority were not. Right, so not disproportionately then? No. What about any other sort of standout personality things? Because you can't help but think that there's something there's something off about somebody that's into this. And again, I say this, I've heard all sorts, I've seen all sorts in the flesh, but there's something about this that even for me is is qualitatively different. It's mm-hmm. it's my gut reaction to it is is sort of disgust, I guess. If I'm being honest, it is it seems like a disgusting act. And so you can't help but think somebody that's doing that, there's something up with them. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And so to to what extent are people and I, I fear that you're going to say that like everybody else. And if that's the, <laughs> if that's the case, that's the case. But I, on the face of it, it's, it would seem unconvincing that that would be the case, that there, there may be something different about these people. I couldn't find anything different. You know, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but they are like anybody else. And what? a lot of them are married. And okay. a lot of their, their spouses have no clue. And, you know, it could be your neighbor, it could be your best friend, it could be anybody, because they don't talk about it. It is something that is so private for exactly the reason that you just mentioned, you know, the people's reaction. So they don't want to experience such negative reaction, and they just keep it to themselves. One of the things I've come across, which maybe speaks to it a bit, I don't know what you think of this. This is from a paper, Simon's uh, Vertel I hope I'm pronouncing that right, and Durham, 2008, says 38% of child sexual abusers reported engaging in bestiality during childhood as compared to 11% of rapists. Of the rapists, 68% reported engaging in acts of childhood cruelty towards animals compared to 44% of child sexual abusers. Um, And so, you know, speaking to that sort of background issue... um, Well, I, I think there's a difference there between, again, between bestiality and zoophilia. You know, having sex with animals or torturing animals in any way is in childhood is a sign of psychopathy, you know. And so it does no no surprise that these guys end up growing up and doing things that are, you know, horrible to, to people or to whoever. But that doesn't mean that everybody who, you know, the, the other way around doesn't doesn't work you know there's no cause and effect here well interesting because i was going to say what do you what would you argue are the 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 psychological origins of it though because this nurture and nature isn't there there's that you you just sort of born this way and that i guess that sort of speaks to what you were saying before that people stumble across say some sort of violent sex scene on the internet and the reason they stay on that video is because it 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 connects with something that's already there. So, you know, a lot of a lot of them were telling me sort of the same story that during puberty, you know, when the hormones go crazy and, you know, the the family dog is is right there and the dog starts sniffing and starts licking and whatever and that's very exciting obviously. You know, anybody who would do anything to a kid who is going through this hormonal craziness, it would be very exciting. And so they kind of, you know, try a little bit more and a little bit more. I, I see. I disagree with you there. Because I think this, I think there's a lot, a lot of people. I think there's plenty of people, in fact, that you can be like horny 15 year old lad. You know, you go through that awful stage where you're just walking around with a boner 24 seven and everyone, everyone looks attracted to you, even like your grandma's mates. It's like, well, she'd get it as well. But if, if you were, you know, you were sat there aroused for whatever reason and the dogs started coming sniffing at you, you'd be like, whoa, get away from me. Exactly. This is why I think it's sexual orientation. Right. So, I mean, so, this is what they've, they told me how it started. But I agree with you. If it was not their sexual orientation, they would get disgusted by the idea and, and kick the dog away. So you would go with the born this way argument with, then? Oh, yeah. Self-born. Yeah. And in fact, I, I also got a lot of people telling me that they started having fantasies about having sex with animals 
before they knew anything about sex. Mm. This is a bit cheesy, and this might be this might be going down the stereotypical route, but people joke a lot about people that live like out in the countryside. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, one one disparaging name that people give to Welsh people in this country is sheep shaggers. This idea that people out in the country, by virtue of proximity to animals and the amount of engagement with animals, are more likely mm-hmm. to be into bestiality. Now, <laughs> is that true or is that stereotyping? Are rural people, people in the countryside, more likely to engage in this? I heard of that in many rural areas, you know, that that's happening. And the question is, is it because they're doing it more or is it because they're doing it out in the open so people can see while other people who live elsewhere are doing it indoors and nobody knows? Right. Okay. Yeah. We don't know. I can tell you that it is a lot more common than people think. How would you define that? When you say it's more common than people think, what do people think and how common is it compared to that? Well, I think most people think it's very rare and we really don't know how prevalent it is because it's it's really difficult to study this. I mean, nobody's going to just tell you, you know, it, it's very hard to find people who will be willing to, to share anything like this. But, you know, because I'm... I researched it and I talked to a lot of people and people have told me story about other people and all that. It just feels like it happens a lot more than people think it does. So would you go as high as the Kinsey, Pomeroy and Martin saying about 8% of men, 5% of women? It's possible. And that was a study just about American men. Yeah, that's a lot of people that. Yeah. Of every 100 people, you meet eight of them. Eight guys and five women. (laughs) You know, what happened with them when they did their study in 1948, they were asking people about sexual outlets, you know, what they do, what do they do to to get off, basically. That was the study. And they never expected to hear about animal sex. Oh, so they weren't even fishing for that then? No. And wow. then they, they ended up having so much information that they dedicated a whole chapter to this. Wow. You see, yeah. One of the things I was going to say as well is that even in psychological studies, even when they're anonymous, I think you have to be willing to put the figure higher when the question you're asking is a difficult or uncomfortable one. So regardless mm-hmm. of the anonymity, there are still people that are going to see on a questionnaire have you ever engaged in sexual relations with an animal? And the name's not on the paper and it's being sent back anonymously. But just in case, they're still going right. to say no anyway. So these are so, these figures are low estimates. <laughs> right. That's what? what, I mean, that's what people say about the study in general, that it's underestimated. Everything they say, it's underestimated. So if that's the case, also their statistics about bestiality is underestimated. Okay, let's let's get a little graphic here. So what are the differences between the the male and the female experience? I'm guessing men go for different acts and different animals and women the same. Well, in my study, most of the people had sex with dogs. That was like the number one. Okay, men and women. Men and women. All the women and most of the men. All of the women and, and most of the men. Remember, I only had 11 women. <laughs> yeah. And see, this is getting into a weird mishmash of, of, of different proclivities here because the, obviously there's different genders of dog <laughs> as well. And so can you, right. can you have a, a gay zoo file as well? That, yeah. Yes. That was in most cases. So, in, okay, right. We're, we're breaking this down now. In most cases, it was men having sex with male dogs. Right. And what about for women? Are they having sex with male or female male, dogs? Male dogs. They're having sex with So the male dogs are the ones getting all the action. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. And uh, the men penetrate, are we talking penetrative sex with it, male dogs? Not, not always. Okay. But more likely the dogs penetrate the men. Oh, yes. Uh, that. 
Mm-hmm. And with the case in, in women, are we talking about, I'm going to guess, we're talking more oral sex than penetrative sex? Well, there's penetrative sex and there's also oral sex. There's also oral sex with the men and, and, and the animals. And the oral sex goes both ways. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's... Yeah, that's intense. Um, yeah, see, you are already uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, you, it, it's like I say, it's it's for me. I just can't. I don't see it. When you talk about human sexuality, you can even even as a straight guy, you can sort of appreciate why a gay guy would find another guy attractive. Mm-hmm. Because uh, you can, it's almost seeing it. I guess through seeing what a woman would find attractive about a guy, you know, if they're, they're sort of masculine and good-looking and muscular and th- all those things, and it's like, okay, well, I get it. Fine, it's not, it's not and my. That's thi- exactly how they talk about the dogs or the animals in general. Like some people were saying, you know, they see a beautiful woman walking down the street yep. with a dog. They don't look at her. <laughs> They look at the dog and there's certain aspects of the dog that is very attractive to them. Right. You know, they look to see how much he's hung and, and the, the muscles and, you know, they were going into this whole description about what is attractive about the dog. Right. So I'm guessing, do we know whether any particular breeds, because I'm guessing a chihuahua is not much use. No, <laughs> but, but then it's, it's large breeds. Right. Oh, so it is. All kinds. Yeah. Large breed dogs yeah. are the thing. And again, is, oh, no, I was going to say interesting that you would expect that the men would find sort of feminine dogs like a poodle <laughs> attractive. No. But no, you said it, it's it's more a male male thing. Yeah. Okay, so controversial question arises out of that then, whether there's a sort of any correlation between homosexuality and bestiality. You know, I, I tried to look at that. I asked everybody to say uh, whether they're, you know, what's their sexual orientation? Yeah. And then what's their sexual orientation with animals? And sometimes it was the same, sometimes it was not. It was not conclusive. Right, okay. I just want to say there are men who prefer female dogs or female animals, but the majority preferred male. And well, with the with the guys that do prefer the female, does that correlate with femininity as well? Like wanting a more, so I don't know, a youthful looking slender dog. That's I, I don't know. That was not described to me. I don't know. <laughs> it's a good question. Yeah, you see, one of the things that's probably worth bringing up here is when you've got these questions, it's it's handy to have someone to hand that's actually got first-hand experience in it. And so before I contacted you, I tried contacting um, different people on different forums, the Zoophile, Bestiality forums, to see whether anyone would be interested in, in doing an interview. And radio silence, for the most part, two people I did get in contact with and I have a conversation with, I got the feeling that they were full of shit. It made me wonder whether a lot of this is actually fantasy. And it made me question whether, like, how many of these people that come and see you have really actually done this and do this? And how many, how many of them it's just a fantasy? And maybe how many of them, for the, how many of them it's a fantasy to sit in front of you and to say this out loud and to gauge your reaction? And maybe that's a... That's a turn on. Like, so, how, much, how much of this is bullshit and just pure fantasy, do you think? It's possible that some of it is bullshit. But the way I did the study, it was before internet. So I actually had a hard copy questionnaire that was um, 35 pages long. And I sent it to people. And they took the time. It was 150 items to fill out, a lot of it was open-ended questions and I got, you know, a huge envelopes back. They took the time to write everything and then to put stamps on it and send it back to me. So maybe they were bullshitting, but I highly doubt that all of them were bullshitting, you know, took the time to do all that. How did you find these people, especially pre-internet? 
I, um, you know, I started spreading the word and somebody at the Institute in France, in San Francisco, where I did my, my doctorate, knew somebody who was into that. And one day I got a call from a woman and she said, I heard that you're looking for subjects to do the study. And she said, I'm a zoo and I am happy to help you because I want the world to know about us. You know, because up until then, I thought I was just going to do a qualitative study about this one client of mine. Right. So I met with her for lunch with a very lovely woman who, who had a boyfriend who was also a zoo. And they said, we can, you know, I, I did not have internet at the time, but it, would, it just started. So they said, you know, there's a, a listserv on the internet with all a lot of different zoos and we can connect you with them and, and you can talk to them and, and maybe they will join the study. So they came to my house they connected me to the internet. That was my first introduction to the internet. And it was, it was amazing. And I was in a chat room with all these zoos from all over the world. And it was an opportunity for everybody to ask me questions about, you know, what I'm going to do uh, with the study, if I'm going to publish it, uh, what's my hypothesis and all that. So, of course, I didn't answer all the questions because that would have biased the study, mm -hmm. but I got in touch with a lot of people. And so I gained their trust and they were willing to give me their actual address so I can send them the questionnaire. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting. Well, I, I can also tell you, so before you said, you know, sitting in front of you, that that may mean something, but it was actually not sitting in front of me. It was filling out the questionnaire and sending it back to me. However, I was invited to a gathering. Okay. And uh, that was very exciting. You know, I, I went to this gathering somewhere in the middle of the United States. It was a two day gathering and they all knew about me. So mm. they expected me to be there. It was very secretive. You know, you can only arrive by invitation, of course. And I walked in and there was a whole bunch of people. I think there were about 30, 40 people. What was the gender split? Mostly men. Of course, yeah. Maybe just <laughs> one or two women. Right. And all these huge dogs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I can tell you at the time, I was afraid of big dogs. <laughs> yeah. And I had to pretend like, you know, I'm the researcher. I'm not afraid of them and I'm cool. And I was able to do it. I was able to get over my fear, but it was, it was quite a scene and it was an opportunity to meet them. And I did the focus group with them as well to figure out what questions I want to ask in my questionnaire. That was before I sent out the questionnaire. And they were like the nicest people. Okay. Really? Yep. They were so nice. And they were just, you know, hanging out, playing cards, watching movies, cooking together. It was just so nice. So I just, just to clarify as well, when you said a minute ago that it was quite a scene, we're not talking about this turning into a, a sort of exhibitionist orgy at any point, are no, we? No, no, no. The scene was the dogs. Right. Okay. Just, just checking. <laughs> <laughs> For me, you know, because I, like I said, I was scared and I walked in and there's all these huge dogs. <laughs> I've got to ask though. So I'm guessing that you've witnessed this, maybe not in person, but the pornography aspect of it. And what's um, your take when you see that act taking place? What's your response to it? You know, I, I watched some of it just to see what it was, mm -hmm. but it's really not my thing. No. So I try not to watch. I have a lot of movies that people have sent me because they think that I probably am into it. And honestly, I have never watched them. One of the things that sort of fascinates me about it is you mentioned then that there was a, you met a couple that were both into it. Mm -hmm. And... The question there is, how does that come up in conversation? <laughs> you know, it's honestly, I mean, for a lot of people, it's hard enough just 
saying to the missus, like, if she'll stick a corset into my heels on or does she want to try anal or something like that? That's one right. thing, and that's hard enough for some people. Some people will go their entire lives with a particular proclivity or a fetish and never share it with a partner, and they'll let the relationship suffer as a result. And you know, You're telling me? That's why people come to see me. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. But then it's another thing altogether to bring that shit up. I mean, I know. what... Do you, I'm guessing this might have come up, like a guy comes in and says, look, I'm into this. <laughs> I think the wife might be possibly up for it. What, right. what, what's, the, what's the advice there when that is somebody's requirement to introduce the missus to it? I know. Well, luckily we have the internet these days. Yes. And so there's different places where people can go and meet other zoos. And sometimes they... They get connected, you know, romantically because they're also interested in, in humans. And there's also other um, websites like FedLife, which I'm sure you're familiar yeah. with, that has all kinds of different fetishes. And people just, you know, they go to whatever interests them and meet other people who are interested in that. Would you say then that that, that sort of fetish, to strike up any sort of relationship, is it's sort of dependent on the internet like without without it you sort of without the internet and, and logging onto a forum are these people doomed to a, a lonely existence well it's it's hard it's much harder without the internet obviously because then you do have to somehow share what you're interested in with your partner and when do you do it and how do you do it and you know what's going to happen after you told them you know the consequences it's it's very scary. And on top of that, it's illegal in many places. Yes. Well, I mean, from my research, I found the only countries it's legal, Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, Cambodia, Thailand, Japan, Russia, Finland, Hungary, Turkey, and Romania. Illegal everywhere else to some degree. That's out of something like 182 countries or something. Yeah, you did good research. Yeah, well, I, tr I, I tried. Um and it's changing all the time. It's changing all the time. Well, we're gonna get, yeah, we're gonna get to that in a minute. I think the other thing on that point that that sort of fascinates me as well is there is a lot of this stuff on the internet. Plenty of videos available, and like you said at the beginning, it's it's mostly women engaged in some sort of interaction with an animal, which is seems to be dogs and horses <laughs> seem to be the right. favorite. I've seen a couple of pigs as well back in the day. What fascinates me about this whole thing is, like we just talked about then, how difficult it is to just tell somebody that I'm into this. So then I'm fascinated how the, how the pornography takes place. Because if it's so difficult to just say to somebody, to anybody, that I have a bit of a thing for animals, it's another thing entirely for someone to go, I want to make a film about this and start a website and a business surrounding it. And then some other people get involved and say, yeah, yeah, I'm up for that, some cameramen or whatever. And then someone has to go to a girl who works in the porn industry to her agent and say, yeah, does she fancy doing a, a scene with an horse? And then the agent goes to her and says, I've got an horse job for you. And she says, yeah, all right, then <laughs> I'll do that. And you can You've film it. you scene already. <laughs> and you can put it on the internet. And it's just, it's... Yeah, I don't know how that really works. No, the logistics... But I can tell you that it's very, very popular. You know, bestiality pornography is one of the most popular things that people go to. Oh, well, let me say, I mean, I run a little website for this podcast, a sort of medium-sized podcast, and the amount of costs and stuff involved in running this small operation would surprise people, all the, all the little costs that come into it. And mm. so the idea of doing that with the camera equipment and the, the sound equipment and the logistics and the agents and the servers and everything that's involved in that, those sites can only exist and survive based on not just a huge audience that's willing to watch it, but a decent enough amount of people that are willing to participate in it from a business perspective as well. I think like you said then, the popularity of it on the internet and the infrastructure required to provide that service is testament yeah. to just how popular and not rare this thing is. Well, I, I can guess, I don't know because... 
like I said, I don't really go to, to watch these things, but I would guess that a lot of it is home videos that people do by themselves. Mm. But that's what I'm saying. You see, a lot of the... Um, I mean, I hate to admit this. Again, most of the stuff I've seen was back when the internet was new and videos... This is back on videos on flip phones and we was all shocking each other in the pubs. But like I say, the, <laughs> the amount of professional, professionally shot videos with multiple people in the room is... Yeah, it surprises me. Anyway, <laughs> let's move on. So one of the things that... I, it's sort of tied back to your reaction to to seeing this this material and hearing about it. I'm wondering what you think about the ethics of it. One of the biggest things that's, that comes up around this topic is people will say, well, this is just as bad as paedophilia because animals cannot consent. Mm -hmm. They don't understand the sexual act. There's not the, any sort of shared language or conceptualization of the world there. So if you engage in sex with an animal, that's tantamount to rape and it's immoral. What would you say to that? Yeah, I, I hear a lot about that. And I was uh, even in one of the talks that I gave, I had a whole bunch of people there just attending just to confront me on that topic. So I know that it's very sensitive and people feel, you know, huge emotions about this. Mm. And when I started the study, the consent issue was not part of what I wanted to really study. You know, I just wanted to know about the people and what they do and how they feel and why they do it. But as I progressed and evolved and have spoken to a lot of different people about this, people who engage in, in sex with animals, I learned a lot. And what I learned is that animals can communicate with body language. You know, you know, if you have a pet, you know when the pet wants you to touch it and when it doesn't. And it will show you very clearly if it doesn't like something that you're doing to it. It's very clear. And most of these people, because they are so in tuned with their animal partners, because they so love them, because they spend so much time with them, they really know what it means when, when the animal communicates with, with their body language. And I also know that you know, I've been told that if the animal is not interested, they don't want to have sex with the animal because they it's very important for them that the animal enjoys it mm. and that the animal wants it. And in many cases, it's the animal who starts. You know, obviously the animal knows, you know, from, from learning from experience, but the animal starts and, and initiates the sex. In addition, like I said, in many, many cases, it's the animal who penetrates. And if if the dog, you know, a dog will hump anything. Yeah. And if you position yourself in the right position, the dog will just, you know, start humping you and, and penetrate. So I don't see how that is abusive. There are cases where it is abusive and there are animals where it is abusive. I'm not saying it's not. But when it comes to dogs, especially, or horses, especially, and those are the, the two most common animals that I have encountered, I, I really don't see how that's abusive. Well, you see, I uncomfortably sort of have to concede that point. I don't, I don't want to. <laughs> But it makes sense, doesn't it? It does I make mean, we sense. Make, we make animals do all kinds of things. You know, we let's take dogs. You know, we leave them home alone all day. If you did that to a child, they'll put you in child protective services. I mean, and the, the child. You can't do that. But you do this with a dog. You force animals to carry things for you. You force them to perform for you. You force them to, I don't know what, you, you even eat them. And nobody really says much about it. But when it comes to sex, all of a sudden, everybody's like, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, you can work it to death. You can neglect it. You can kill it and eat it. But just do not have sex with it. <laughs> right. right. Um, on this topic, though, rather uncomfortably, there is a, a sub- section of the 
that people with this fetish, or maybe you'd, you'd say it's a completely different fetish, known as zoosadism. And this is people that have sex with animals, but in an abusive way. So famously, a few years ago, there was these crushing videos that were going on on the internet, which is basically, I think it was things like kittens and hamsters. Yeah, that's horrible. That were being put under a board and then crushed, or like women were crushing and wearing high heels and stilettos and things like that. Right, uh, but that has nothing to do with sex. That's no, no, it doesn't. Abuse. Yes, yes, it is. However, honestly, honey, this is one of the most uncomfortable lines I've ever read in my entire life. And I've read a lot of shit. And this was from your book. This was somebody saying, I've slit open the stomach yeah. of puppies in order to penetrate the hole. Yeah, I had one guy in the study who who said that, you know, I asked a lot of different questions in my questionnaire because I figured this is like my one chance to ask anything and to find out as much information as I can. So one of the questions was also, have you ever hurt an animal? Yep. And he responded with yes. And he told me that he slit open puppies in order to, to penetrate the hole. And it was, it was horrible. And I, I heard later, you know, from other zoos talking that this guy is, is antisocial. You know, right. he's got a problem. And the zoos were very, very much against him. And there was, there was a big deal with the, the zoo community. They started outing each other and blaming each other. And, you know, like in every community, there's issues. But this guy was like... You know, he shamed everybody. Everybody felt really bad. And I I asked my uh, doctoral committee if I should even include him in, in the study, in, in my uh, dissertation and book, because he he skewed all the results. And they said, you, you should probably not include him. And I felt like, even though they said that, I decided to leave him in because I figured, you know, I'm not going to hide the mm. truth. You know, there are people who do these things and it's horrible. But that doesn't mean that all the zoos do that. I mean, the majority don't. What? Um, so you, you've you just said then it's a minority of people that, that do something like that. And that's that's sort of understandable. I think we'd sort of get that intuitively, even if we weren't talking about bestiality that sort of extreme level of abuse is a minority in any sector of the population. But how often have you encountered people where you think they're engaging in something inappropriate? So, you know, if, if it's a woman having sex with a dog and the dog seems fine with it and it's just like, look, well, whatever, <laughs> you know, that's your thing and there doesn't seem to be anything sort of necessarily immoral going on. How often does it fall into a gray area for you where you think, oh, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. I have, I have never encountered anyone that I, I felt was abusive towards the animal. The people that I have encountered uh, in person were all very loving and caring and they would do anything to, to make sure that animals in general, I mean, they love animals. A lot of them are in um, in organizations that that help animals. You know, they really love animals. They'll do anything to make sure they're okay. Yeah, so I guess in, in a weird way, it's not so much... Um, I think the gut reaction to this is it's a sort of um, a pure objectification. You're sort of using the animal as this sort of uh, like a masturbation sleeve or something like that. Right. That's why there's a big difference between bestiality and zoophilia. Right. But would you, that's it for, for most people. Would you say it's like, a, I don't know, like just a genuine sort of romantic connection? For or, the zoos, yeah. Yeah. Like it would be like it would be with between two human beings. It's, it's the, to the same degree with. Yes. And, and some of them even married their animal partner. Right. You know, they had somebody perform a ceremony and they really treat their partner as a spouse. Wow. You know, right. Okay. My, 
My final question, a bit of a curious one, this. Now, this is somebody else quoting you from a paper, so whether or not it's accurate. I can't remember the name of the, the girl that wrote this paper, but she basically said that of all the clients you'd encountered, it was only about 8% of males and 0% of females that wanted to stop having sex with the, with animals. And so my question for that is, when, when people are coming to see you about this issue, what it, what is it that they want? Because if it's not to stop, that would be the obvious thing. I feel guilty about it and I want to stop. But if they don't, what's what's the point? Well, that, that's what I said in the beginning, that a lot of people come from very far away to see me just so that they can talk about anything and be authentic. So they can come and talk about the fact that they also want to have a human partner and they don't know how to how to share that with them. You know, like you said before, how do you tell your partner that you're into this? Mm. So that could be a reason, or it could be just any other reason. You know, they may have issues with their kids or with their boss, or they have depression or anxiety or other stressors in life, but they want to include that part of their life in the conversation so that the therapist knows everything because i think that if if you don't share all of you to the therapist if you keep things away you're not really being honest with yourself so i think it's really important to share everything and this is a big part of their life yeah you, you know, know yeah I'd, I'd concur with that to the extent that i've I actually spoke about this on a previous episode where i interviewed a girl that is a friend of mine who worked as an escort in the industry for a long time she's actually gone back into it now we were saying that bizarrely enough one of the draws of the industry for us wasn't the sexuality the adventures that you have it wasn't the drugs or i mean all that stuff was great with the drugs early on i'm a bit old for that now the pull of it for us was being in a room full of people where you could just be completely yourself and completely authentic Mm -hmm. we used to have these in-call rooms where the girls clients would come to the girls the girls would be waiting at the apartments or whatever to see them and it was my job to sort of look after the girls make sure the guys didn't take the piss and we'd sit around in those apartments for hours on end and you know sometimes we'd be talking about our own sort of sexuality and things like that other times we'd be talking about your past things that you've got going on in your life but by virtue of being in that environment Nobody, nobody's got any secrets. Like everybody knows what everybody's doing. We're all up to no good. We're all doing a bit, mm -hmm. it's all a bit dodgy. And so that enables you to just completely be yourself with answer questions, honestly, and tell people your deepest, darkest secrets. And yeah, that's so important to have such a community. Yeah. And there's something incredibly cathartic about that. And then the problem with it is when you go back in out into the real world and we all, we refer to it as talking to civilians like this, mm -hmm. I think that's maybe stolen from like Vietnam veterans. Like they don't understand it; they weren't there. But when right. you, you go back out into the into the real world, and you can't have those conversations with people, you can't be that honest with people, and so it pulls you back into it. You you desperately want to get back into that industry again, not for the sex or the drugs or the rock and roll, but just to be around people that you can be yourself around. So, right, and this is why they so wanted to help me. And, and participate in the study because they wanted to have somebody that they can really share everything with, mm. with, with the hope that it will be published so that the world knows about it. Yeah. Make their lives a little bit easier as a, as a result of it, potentially, I guess. Right. I have to ask though, again, this is something that I sort of feel or felt in, in my old job. Do you ever get exhausted with it? Or just tired, like I've like I've had enough. I'd I'd often, you know, I'd hear about an anal sex story or something like that, and I'm just like, oh, I'm just, I've had enough. I've got anal sex exhaustion. <laughs> <laughs> Do you get that with it, where it's just like, oh, enough, enough with the sex and the goat sort of thing? I, I guess in a way, yes. You know, in the beginning, I used to really follow the news. Every time you heard about somebody that had sex with something and. <laughs> You know, what happened with that and all the the drama and court situation and all that. And now I'm like, okay, it's another case. I, I don't even read the news yeah. anymore. 
Yeah, again, what, one of the things that's happened with us a lot is I think a lot of us that have got out of the industry, after all the whips and the chains and the this and the that, it's just nice to have good old-fashioned naked sex <laughs> with no <laughs> with no bells and whistles, just old-school sex the way it's always been done. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's, yeah, it has that paradoxical effect of turning you completely vanilla again, and but making vanilla completely amazing. Um, so... Anyway, Hanny, I guess we'll leave it there. That's enough. Um, oh, that's plenty of this subject. I, I've got. I've got to admit, I've I've got exhaustion from it already. Um, just <laughs> a, after an hour and a half, because it is a. It's it's one hell it's one hell of a topic. Um, but I'm it good. is. Yeah. I mean, we we could be talking about this for a whole day, but it's so much to take in. Yeah. Well, and just to sort of clue people in, so you, sex therapist in general, bestiality is one of the your topics of research. But an, another one is mother son incest as well. Mm -hmm. So right. potential teaser there. If you ever want to come back on the podcast, f feel free to take that as a as an invitation as well, because that's definitely within our remit. But in the meantime. As always, if you'd like to plug away for a moment, tell people about your website, any books, and if, you know, anybody's out there that actually wants to come and speak to you about this, or they don't have to come and speak to you, speak to you via Zoom or something like that, get your, mm -hmm. your therapy services. Yeah, feel free to plug away for a moment. Okay, thank you. Well, I mean, anybody listening to this, feel free to come visit me on my website, which is drmiletsky.com. That's D-R with no period for doctor. And then my last name, M-I-L-E-T-S-K-I.com. And there's information there about my book, Understanding Bestiality and Zoophilia, as well as the other book that you just mentioned, Mother Son Incest. And um, you can contact me if you have any questions or if I can be of any help. And um, I don't know what else to say. Well, just, uh, yeah, look forward to <laughs> hearing from some of my <laughs> listeners, I guess. Um, yeah, like I always yeah. like I always do, I will include all those links to uh, Hanny's book and the website in the show notes. I will try and dig up that interview that you did as well for the Grand Tour on YouTube as well. All those okay. links will be included in the show notes. In the meantime, Dr. Hanny Molesky, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you very much yourself. <laughs>